Business could ask guests leaving the gallery to do so quietly, please. This Parliament is still in session. The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 12938 in the name of Neil Finlay on expanding coverage of the living wage. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to participate in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Neil Finlay to open the debate. Seven minutes or so, Mr Finlay. Thanks, President Officer. Um, over 414,000 Scots, uh, many of them are working in this city. 16,000 of them in my county in West Lothian are paid below uh, the living wage of 7 85 an hour. This represents 20% uh, of our local workforce. And for these workers, low pay and job insecurity act like a cancer eating away at them, uh, impacting on every aspect of their lives. It affects their health, diet, housing, relationships, and the general well-being of them, their family, and their community. And if we couple that with that zero hours job insecurity that we see at the moment, that situation is made dramatically worse. If you don't know how many hours you're working, if, how much pay you'll receive, then how on earth can you plan your life, your budget, pay your bills and provide for your family? It's this combination of low pay and job insecurity combined with the attack on the benefits safety net that has resulted in the growth of payday lenders, food banks and in-work poverty. Low pay and job insecurity is not just bad for our people, but also bad for our economy and the cohesion of our wider society. And it's even more galling when we see the huge concentration of wealth held in so few hands across Scotland and the UK. Only last week we saw the Sunday Times rich list showed, and it showed how the very wealthiest in our country have doubled their wealth in the last 10 years, while the rest have experienced a real terms cut in incomes. So as policy makers, the challenge is, what do we do about these things? Because at all levels of government, there are things that can and should be done. Yes, of course, there are EU rules. Yes, employment law is reserved. But we in this parliament are not powerless to act, and we have a duty to do so. The Scottish Government said it would produce statutory guidance on the living wage when the Procurement Reform Bill was passed in 2008. 14. Yet here we are, a year later, and no statutory guidance has been produced. The Scottish Government continue to hide behind EU advice and new EU directives as a reason to delay issuing that guidance. But like any EU advice, of course, it's what you ask and how you ask it that determines the advice given. So if you ask, can we force companies to pay the living wage through publicly procured contracts, then you're likely to get a negative response. But if you ask, how can we use public procurement to ensure the living wage is paid through publicly procured contracts? Then you're likely to get a very different response. And I think this gets to the nub of the issue. It's my view that rather than be inventive, enthusiastic, evangelic about extending the living wage, the Scottish Government, after eight years, has had to be forced to act at every stage. And this delay and failure, certainly. Minister. I wonder if Neil Finlay is aware that Labour's own manifesto no longer talks about mandating or insisting upon the living wage, even through procurement contracts, and instead says they'll try and promote the living wage. Are they too cowed by EU advice? Neil Finlay. There is lots in the Labour manifesto that will ensure that the living wage is extended. I can assure you, and I will come to that. And this uh, delay and failure has affected 39,000 Scots. Information from Spice estimates that 147,000 jobs are created from government procurement, and that 39,000 of these jobs pay less than the living wage. Had the Scottish Government issued statutory guidance, then those 39,000 workers could be £2,600 a year better off. What a difference that would have made to families struggling to pay the bills. But it was only in February that they issued not statutory guidance, but a policy note, finally conceding that fair pay can be a consideration in contract waiting. So will the government now apply this waiting to all of its own contracts to ensure that fair pay and fair employment practices are given significant waiting in all contract tendering? I hope the minister will answer that when he replies. Will the government now fund councils properly to ensure that across the public sector this can be rolled out? Will the government go back to the EU and ask a different question to see how we can expand
the coverage of the living wage? Will the government make it clear to government agencies that they have to end situations like that at TerraQuest, a contractor for Disclosure Scotland, paying just £7.10 per hour to workers who are held for years on temporary contracts? Will the government end the use of the so-called fiddle clause being used by management at Visit Scotland and the National Museum to prevent the full living wage being paid to staff in these organisations? President officer, I have no doubt the Cabinet Secretary will mention the Scottish Living Wage Accreditation Scheme. 186 employers are accredited, and I congratulate each and every one of them. But there are 335,000 private sector businesses alone in Scotland. President officer, the, accredit the accredited employers at the moment represent 0.05 of 1% of Scottish private sector businesses that have signed up. Hardly a revolution in the workplace. Indeed, maybe the Minister could boost that figure, figure by one by signing up himself. Finally, President Officer, with a Labour government, we will, through make work pay contracts, give tax rebates to businesses who signed up to pay the living wage in the first year of a Labour government. We will require publicly listed companies to report on whether or not they pay the living wage. Yes, Mr Wilson. John Wilson. Thank you, the member, for giving way. Could the member indicate what raising the national minimum wage to £8 an hour in 2020 does for many low-paid workers who have been demanding the introduction of the living wage by the Scottish Government? Surely the Labour Party would be more honest to say that the national minimum wage should become the living wage. No, I, think, I think Mr Wilson and I share that ambition, absolutely. Um, and can I say that um, what, we, what we propose, along with many other uh, uh, policies in our manifesto, will change the lives of working people? Because if you look what is being proposed to end zero hours exploitation, an end to tribunal fees, establishing a Scottish hazard centre, a future fund for young people, new legislation on corporate homicide and fatal accident inquiries, an end to agency exploitation, action on umbrella companies, an inquiry into blacklisting and a commitment to build a fairer deal for the care sector. This, along with the living wage proposals, is a major package of measures to improve the rights of workers across Scotland. And I look forward to support from Mr Wilson and others when the Labour government introduces all of these measures after May the 7th. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. John Mason to be followed by Mary Fee. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and can I also thank Neil Finlay for again raising uh, this very important issue. Firstly, I do welcome any moves to reduce in work poverty, and clearly every employer has a duty, a moral duty, uh, to pay employees enough for them actually to live on that wage. I think we can be encouraged that many more employers are now accredited living wage employers. And I'm sure there are others who are doing it who have not actually sought accreditation, probably including myself. We can also be encouraged that the public in Scotland seem very aware of the concept of the living wage, with nearly 90% saying they have heard of it, compared to 80% at a UK level. Therefore, I'm fully supportive of rolling out the living wage as far as we possibly can. There has been significant progress with public contracts, and I gather that both the new ScotRail franchise and the Scottish Government catering contract are ensuring that all staff get this living wage as they should. Uh, briefly, yes. Dr Simpson. Join him in congratulating those contracts, but I wonder if you'd join me in congratulating Labour-led Stirling Council, who this month have introduced an £8 minimum wage for all their workers. John Mason. I, I mean, I'm delighted that councils are taking the lead in this, and Glasgow uh, has, certainly has as well, uh, and that's great. Um, however, I'll come on to my main argument that actually we need to worry a bit more about the private sector uh, and because it's falling behind. Uh, now, the motion talks about ensuring that the living wage is paid, and I think that this is where we hit problems. My understanding is that we cannot make payment of the living wage a mandatory requirement as part of procurement, but public bodies' procurement strategies will have to make a statement of their general policy on payment of a living wage. So, yes, the living wage is a good concept, and I certainly support it, but I do wonder if the motion somewhat overstates the importance of the living wage as if it was the only or best answer to the problem of low pay. Because the reality is that the key fundamental piece of legislation 
on unacceptably low pay is not around the living wage, but is the legislation on the statutory minimum wage. At the end of the day, the living wage is always going to be a voluntary device, and we have to think of all sorts of imaginative ways of making it less voluntary and more of a requirement. So that is why I lodged my amendment to Mr Finlay's motion. The motion really only deals with public sector contracts and who has the power to insist on what conditions. But what about all the employers, and Mr uh, Finlay mentioned 335, I'm sorry, I have taken an intervention already, 335,000 uh, private uh, sector um, employers. Who, what about the number of them that do not have public sector contracts and may never have any interest in public sector contracts? Is it OK for them to keep on paying less than the living wage? No, it is not. Now, I'm happy to give credit to previous Labour governments at Westminster who introduced a statutory minimum wage, but I suspect Mr Finlay may be somewhat embarrassed that these same Labour governments left it at such a low level. This is the kind of topic where SNP MPs at Westminster could give a minority Labour government a bit more backbone. We know that Mr Finlay and many of his colleagues are not happy with how far to the right Labour have moved, under Tony Blair and others. So I very much hope that after next Thursday we will see a more progressive grouping in London than Labour on its own seems able to offer. Now I do accept that some smaller employers, for example pubs, might struggle to pay all staff a living wage, but I think the answer to that is to target support towards them, as has been done with the Small Business Bonus Scheme, rather than allowing all businesses to pay low wages. And whether or not Westminster increases the statutory minimum wage, let's have that power transferred here to Westminster. It seems there is a greater appetite on the two main parties to seriously tackle low pay. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I very much support the rollout of a voluntary living wage, but that is always going to be second best compared to a decent statutory minimum wage. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Mary Fee to be followed by Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this short but important debate, and I will focus mainly on women and in-work poverty. And I hope there is broad consensus across Parliament in support of the living wage, and we'd like to begin by recognising the progress that has already been made. I am glad that the Scottish Government has reaffirmed its commitment to support the living wage in principle through its aim to encourage all public sector bodies to pay its employees at least the living wage. And I welcome the inclusion of a Workforce Matters question when considering procurement contracts for catering on Scottish Government premises, especially since the majority of those employed in the catering industry are women. This is an encouraging sign, and I hope that the Scottish Government will continue to encourage more employers to adopt this position wherever possible. I was also particularly interested to see the findings from the Working Together Review, which recommended that the Scottish Government work closely with trade unions to achieve fairer employment practices. And I hope that this is something the Fair Work Commission will consider at its first meeting. However, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. And as my colleague Neil Finlay has mentioned, nearly half a million Scots are paid less than the living wage. And in Renfrewshire, almost one in five working age adults are paid less than the living wage. And in the Scottish Government's latest report on poverty published last month, 22% of children were in relative poverty in 2012-13. The first increase in child poverty after decades of progress in reducing it. There's been a marked increase in the number of Scots experiencing in-work poverty. And these are things we should all be ashamed of. Promoting the adoption of the living wage is essential if we are serious about attempting to alleviate poverty. Scottish Government research into poverty has also revealed that although relative poverty has decreased, the poverty that remains has become deeper and more entrenched. Young mothers and single parents who are disproportionately women are more likely to be in poverty than the average person in Scotland. But we know that poverty is not caused simply by unemployment. Almost 60% of children in poverty in Scotland live in working households, and 50% live in households where at least one adult is in full-time employment. Hourly rate of pay, number of hours worked, and income gained or lost through taxation and welfare were, indicated, were identified as key factors in influencing in-work poverty. Also important was the ability 
of families to balance work and caring responsibilities, again disproportionately affecting women, as families across Scotland struggle to meet the cost of childcare, which continues to rise much faster than take-home pay. In Scotland, 22.4% of women are earning less than the living wage, compared to 13.9% of men. This figure rises to as high as 72% in the hospitality sector, 43% in the retail sector and 33% in administrative roles, industries in which there is again a disproportionate concentration of women. Across all sectors in Renfrewshire, a woman working full-time can expect to earn on average only 79% of a man's median full-time earnings. And this is simply not fair. Introducing a living wage across all industries in Scotland would go some way in addressing this gender divide. And to summarise, the scandal of low pay has a direct and measurable impact on both the prevalence of child poverty and in-work poverty, which again disproportionately affects women. Women are less likely to be paid the living wage than men, and the sectors that are least likely to pay the living wage are also the sectors where the greatest number of working women are concentrated. The first step we need to take in addressing these problems is through the widespread adoption of the living wage. And I hope that the Scottish Government will lead by example through giving serious consideration to the payment of the living wage when choosing suppliers in public procurement and encourage private sector employers to always pay the living wage where possible. Thank you. Many thanks. At this point, can I advise the Chamber that due to the number of members who have indicated they would like to speak in the debate, I am minded to accept a motion from Neil Finlay under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr Finlay? Moved. That has been moved. Is the Chamber agreed? We are. Thank you. I now call Gavin Brown to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by congratulating Neil Finlay on securing this afternoon's debate. We have debated at the living wage a number of times in this chamber, and I'm sure we'll do so again. But what is slightly different, I think, about today's debate is that Mr Finlay has chosen a rather specific focus. He has wanted to focus on the procurement guidance given to public sector organisations by the Scottish Government. And therefore, I'll address uh, my remarks specifically mm -hmm. towards that guidance, and I'll address my comments in the main uh, to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Mr Keith Brown, who I know has a bit of a reputation for listening uh, to opposition members. And I will attempt to be as constructive as possible in terms of the guidance that has been published and indeed the statutory guidance uh, that will come out, I understand, later in this year. So at the moment, we have uh, a policy note uh, from February of this year, trying to outline, I think, as best as possible to public sector organisations the routes they ought to follow um, as and when they include questions on workforce matters and when they intend to use workforce matters as one of the criterion on which to base their procurement contract. Now, the guidance is fine as far as it goes, but I have to say, if the statutory guidance is going to work, if it's going to achieve the policy objective of the uh, Scottish Government, which is to uh, in increase uh, the number of contracts that have the living wage within them, then I think some pretty uh, substantial differences will be needed uh, going forward. I understand there is a consultation ongoing, which uh, may well tease some of those, those issues out. But I think uh, the guidance is probably not as clear as it needs to be. Uh, if it's going to get specific action. And there is late on, just to give you one uh, paragraph in particular that jumped out at me, paragraph 18, where it says public bodies are uh, asked to note this advice wherever it is legally possible to do so, uh, without giving really too much definition on what is legally possible. If you're in any doubt as to whether adopting the measures proposed are legally possible, you should take appropriate legal advice. Now, of course, um, nothing wrong with saying that, but the, I think the issue in policy terms is if the risk and if the obligation to seek legal advice is passed down the way to other public sector organisations, then I think in fact some of them won't take legal advice and will just take a risk-free option, which is not to include a workforce matters question in their procurement exercise, or to take a very um, 
cautious attitude towards it because it, it, no public sector organisation wants to get it wrong. Bottom line, if they get it wrong, they probably get sued um, and end up paying out uh, legal bills and compensation and damages, uh, none of which goes towards helping paying the living wage. I think we probably need some leadership from the Scottish Government here, partly because they are the central government, but more importantly because they have more experience of contracting than many of the public sector bodies who are going to do so, so they can pass that experience on to those bodies. And also because I just think they have a greater legal resource and greater budgets in order to seek legal advice. The Scottish Government, I just think, is in a stronger position to get as much legal advice as possible compared to perhaps one of the smaller councils or some of the smaller public sector bodies who, again, would probably want to follow the guidance but may fear to do so. The guidance, when it comes out, needs to be as clear as possible. It's good that the example in relation to the catering contract was set out in Annex A, but I think we need to see as many examples of Scottish Government uh, contracts as possible, uh, so that there's not just one example, but as many as possible, so that um, public sector organisations have a very, very clear focus on the sort of questions that they are entitled to ask, the ones that are completely uh, legally safe, so that they can have a re really uh, simple uh, idea on what sort of weighting can go into workforce matters. We know it's 10% in terms of the catering contract, but that's just one contract. Some kind of, uh, I think, greater uh, spread of advice in relation to that would be helpful to public sector organisations. Um, and perhaps some definitions as to what is meant really by where it can be deemed to be relevant. Can the Scottish Government, uh, if not an exhaustive list of examples, at least a, uh, an illustrative list, also with things that are proportionate and indeed things like place of performance. As many definitions as possible. And I understand my time is up, uh, De Deputy President, also, so I'll end it there. But just to say, I hope the government uh, can take all of that on board so that the policy objective is more likely to be achieved when the statutory guidance is published. Thank you. Many thanks. I call Christina McKelvey to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The living wage is indeed about dignity and security. Of that much, I will agree with Neil Finlay. And can I thank him from, for bringing this debate to the Chamber because it gives us another opportunity to expose the Labour's position on the living wage. And I'll follow that up in a minute. Presiding Officer, action and only action when it's promised and when it's delivered will make the difference. The number of accredited living wage employers now stands at over 180, with a target being set for 500. I am one of those living wage employers. With all the commitments we have heard today from Labour, why didn't Labour support the evolution of all employment laws and rights in their Smith Commission submission? They didn't. And that baffles me to come back to this chamber every single time to have the same debate with the same commitments made, but not when the chance comes up to make the commitment that Labour Party actually take that chance. Presiding officer, the previous executive did nothing in the eight years to encourage or even implement the living wage. The current Scottish Government has implemented the living wage in all of its departments and agencies and is working hard with public contractors and employers through the living wage accreditation scheme, something that Neil Finlay seems to think is OK to talk down rather than talk up. The Scottish Government is establishing a Fair Work Convention working with the STUC to realise their aspiration of decent work and dignified lives. And the Scottish Government will issue the statutory guidance that's been called for, something the Labour executive never did. Presiding officer, can I thank Alex Thompson from Channel 4 News for exposing the rank hypocrisy of a party who promised everything in campaigns but delivers absolutely nothing in government? The point the people of Scotland have to deal with now is who do they trust? Do they trust those who don't take the opportunity of the Smith Commission to have the evolution of employment rights and laws to Scotland? They don't trust a party who promises everything on zero-hour contracts and doesn't deliver it. And that brings me back to Alex Thompson of Channel 4 News. He was interviewing Ed Balls and Jim Murphy last week. And they were surrounded by young people with placards saying, end zero hours contracts now. I agree with them, absolutely. However, those young people, those technicians were actually on zero hours contracts. 
working for the Labour Party in their campaign on zero hours contracts. And it seemed to be that the two leaders, Ed Balls and Jim Murphy, had absolutely no idea. So let's deal with the facts. A party who says one thing in a campaign and doesn't deliver, a party who has got the audacity to do interviews while surrounded by young people on exploitative zero-hour contracts. Where actually zero-hour contracts are in place, I'm, I'm not sure whether the Labour Party are, are they ex exploitative or not exploitative. Which ones are the good ones? Which ones are the bad ones? They're absolutely confused on it. So I come back to trust. And who do we trust? Who does the Scottish people trust when they go to the polls next week? Do they trust talk? Do they trust obfuscation? Do they trust an Ed Balls that stands there surrounded by young people on zero-hour contracts? Or do they trust the SNP to deliver that voice at Westminster and in turn bring the rights to this parliament to ensure that we do the right thing for the people of Scotland when it comes to these issues. And on that page, Neil Finlay and I will agree that Scotland should have the power to do this. He just doesn't agree that Scotland has got the ability to take that power. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis MacDonald, to be followed by Alison Johnston, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And we heard just a few moments ago from the First Minister her criticisms of this party for a lack of positive ideas. I think the contribution we've just heard might count as one of the most negative contributions ever heard in a member's business debate. I, on my part, congratulate Neil Finlay on bringing this motion for debate and especially on doing so at this critical time. Next week, voters in Scotland will decide what kind of government we want for the wider United Kingdom. And it is on issues like the living wage that there are choices to be made. It is easy to forget that oh, it is only 20 years since the very idea of putting general wage levels into statute was novel and controversial, opposed by some and not supported by others. Over the years, progressive governments had imposed wage regulation in sectors like agriculture, where too many employers imposed poverty wages and blocked trade union efforts to represent working people. And it was the wider attacks on trade union organisation and free collective bargaining by Conservative governments in the 1980s, which showed that that limited intervention was no longer enough. Labour recognised the need for a national minimum wage, and that was one of our first priorities, one of the first things we did after we turfed out that Conservative government in 1997. John Wilson. Lewis MacDonald for giving way, but would Lewis MacDonald not accept the national minimum wage was not a new concept in Europe, that several countries in Europe had adopted the national minimum wage at higher rates than the Labour Party introduced when they did in 1999. Lewis MacDonald. We've, we've just heard a contribution from the SNP benches saying that Labour does nothing when it has the chance. The national minimum wage is absolute evidence and proof that the opposite is true, that it's Labour that doesn't talk but actually does. And it was Labour which was the first government in Britain to bring that forward. And building on that policy will quite rightly be a top priority if Labour win the election next week. Of course, the national minimum wage did not end poverty, but it has made a huge difference to the lives of millions of people. And along with tax credit for the low paid, it helped many working people to escape the poverty trap. Wage regulation can do that again if that is what people vote for next week. But we have rightly gone beyond the national minimum wage to make the case for a living wage and to seek to roll it out as widely as possible. Again, that will not solve every problem, but it does make ending poverty and ending the need for food banks that much easier to achieve. In my own region, I'm delighted that Aberdeen City Council adopted the minimum wage as a minimum hourly, the living wage as a minimum hourly rate in 2012, not only for hundreds of permanent staff who were previously paid less, but also for those employed on an occasional basis as well. And Sport Aberdeen have followed that good example and, have, and so too have Bon Accord Care. Aberdeenshire Council decided to bring in the living wage in 2013 and backdated it to the previous year, giving a very welcome lump sum to the lowest paid. The difference for the lowest paid staff in the City Council, which has come from introduction of the living wage three years ago, is equivalent to an additional £1,400 a year for a full-time employee. 
but a living wage for public sector workers alone misses part of the point of that wage intervention, which is to support those most in need of legal protection because of the jobs they do or the lack of trade union organisation in their sectors. Enlightened employers in the third sector also pay the living wage. Aberdeen YMCA do so, for example, because it is ethically the right thing to do. And so do highly competitive commercial concerns in the North East, like Brewdog, like Aberdeen Asset Management. They also know that well-paid staff are ultimately good for the bottom line. Imposing the living wage as a condition of public sector contracts is not an add-on to a policy for public sector workers. It is bringing the living wage to bear where it can help the most. And if it's good enough for public services and for the best employers in the private sector, then it should be good enough right across the economy. That's why Neil Findlay is right to press the Scottish Government to do more and do more quickly to ensure that private firms which seek public money meet the test of fair employment and fair pay. I hope the Minister will respond in positive terms to the case that has been made for that today. Thank you. I now call Alison Johnston to be followed by James Kelly. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank Neil Finlay for giving us the opportunity to debate this important topic today. There is general agreement that the minimum wage has been a progressive step despite dire predictions when it was introduced. However, it is set at too low a level. Surely a minimum wage shouldn't be below the level of a wage that you can live on. Often people on the minimum wage require help from the state to meet living costs, a subsidy to help meet housing rents. And we're effectively making up the difference when pay is too low and we're subsidising those high rents. Greens want to see the minimum wage raised to the level of the living wage, £7.85 at present, then raised to £10 per hour over a five-year period. But that, of course, may need to be revised depending on what happens to average wages and living costs. The minimum income standard um, calculated by Loughborough University reckon that £9.20 is the figure that we need at the moment for a socially acceptable standard of living in the UK. A living wage will benefit those on low incomes. It will reduce the dependence on loan sharks, on payday lenders, and we need to bear in mind that the poorest people typically pay the highest interest charges, although they're least able to afford them. And most of this increased pay will be spent back into the economy. We know that people on low pay spend a higher proportion of their income. Sadly, they have little choice. Saving seems a distant dream. But state funding would then be freed up for other uses, as it's no longer required to subsidise employers who pay poor wages. And does it really make sense that shareholders benefit from profits when employees of the companies who are so often responsible for making those profits haven't been paid a living wage? I think as well as practical action, we need a cultural shift. I would suggest that shareholders, uh, there, will, there will be some who share these concerns. Don't accept your, your dividend if you don't know that these employees have been paid a living wage. And as I stated at the beginning, how many people now seriously oppose the minimum wage? At the time of its introduction, concerns were raised that businesses would close down, that employment would fall, and so on. But it's been recognised that there are so many advantages to having a well-paid, a better-paid workforce. You retain more staff. The staff feel motivated and valued. Productivity, a serious issue for this country, improves. We harm these positive working relationships when people feel undervalued. And if we still feel that a particular sector needs or should benefit from public subsidy, then let's look at that, perhaps with direct financial assistance. I don't believe that Amazon needs public subsidy. I'd like to see that cash transferred into hundreds of thousands of small businesses who could perhaps take on an apprentice, who could pay their staff more. You know, this is a business, we, we need Amazon's taxis and we need them paid in full to contribute to a living wage. And if a business depends for its survival on paying poverty wages, then I would suggest it's not a sustainable one. So we need to question, are there companies in receipt of government grants who don't pay a living wage? Are there companies who declare big profits, share these out amongst a few shareholders when their staff aren't being paid a living wage? Taxpayers in this country want to contribute to the good of society, not to top up these private profits. All employees deserve the dignity of a living wage. Thank you. Many thanks.
And I now call James Kelly to be followed by John Wilson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And like others, uh, I'd like to thank Neil Finlay for bringing this uh, motion, member's motion to the Chamber and giving members the opportunity to take part in a debate that not only promotes the living wage but explores how the living wage can be extended by government and also by private companies. Because there's no doubt, as Neil Finlay outlined, the, the case that fo with 414,000 Scots uh, not been on the living wage, that many in our communities, including my own constituency, uh, are struggling uh, to, with the cost of living crisis, and that struggle is, is even greater if they're not being paid a proper wage. And as Mary Fee outlined, uh, unfortunately, many women, uh, over 60% of women, uh, are not being paid the living wage, and they are being, they are being hit uh, harder. So I think there's an onus uh, on us all, on government, on councils, and on businesses uh, to promote and to try and extend that living wage. Because there's no doubt that there are, there are twin advantages. There are advantages to, to, to individuals, but there are also advantages to businesses in the living wage being paid. Uh, those who receive payment of the living wage uh, takes them up to uh, a more adequate level of income coming into their household. Um, many, uh, many not in receipt of the living wage are working in the retail, uh, the retail sector. They're also uh, living in some of our uh, poorest uh, accommodation, uh, and it therefore becomes you know, more difficult um, to bring up you know, children and to ensure that they have a sound and solid education when there's not enough money being coming into the house where people aren't able to feed their family properly uh, and heat their homes. So we need to tackle these issues. And there is a need uh, for leadership from uh, businesses. There is an advantage to a business in having employees that are paid properly. Those employees will then for, uh, will be more loyal uh, to the company. They'll be more motivated. Uh, and that will be rewarded in terms of a more stable workforce, which in turn uh, has benefits to the business uh, in terms of that business being able to operate uh, more effectively. And I think that's why you see, even in the football uh, sphere, you see uh, Hearts took a, a great lead in Scotland by ensuring that all their employees uh, would be paid the living wage. And I think that's something that uh, has got to be congratulated. Um, I think in terms of the Scottish Government, they could do more. Uh, clearly, uh, everyone who's covered by the public sector pay policy has paid the living wage, and that's welcome. But there are people uh, working in Scottish government locations and prisons and other locations who have not been paid the living wage. And I think the Cabinet Secretary should commit to a review of all Scottish government employees to explore where they're not being paid the living wage and ensure that living wage is extended. In terms of the procurement legislation that was passed, I think it's regrettable that over a year down the line we still don't have the statutory guidance. I think the government has got to show more political will. I don't think it's good enough simply to hide behind the EU legal advice. If you look at what has been done in London, you can pay uh, a living wage. There's a way of doing it. You've got to link it to the performance of the contracts. And it's to, to, yeah, I'll take an intervention. Minister. Uh, would he acknowledge, as seems to be acknowledged now in the Labour Party manifesto, that it can't be mandated, and the London boroughs, which I think he's referring to, have also admitted when questioned they cannot insist on that under EU law. Does he accept that position? James Kelly. I would say to the, what I would say to the Minister is every time this is debated, um, the Minister and his predecessors, you know, you hide behind the legal advice. What I would like you to do, Minister, is explore how you, how you can take this, this legal position to the limit and, and try and ensure that, because there is legal advice that shows you how to do it, to try and explore that you link it to the performance of the contracts. You have not, even leaving aside the legal issue, you have not, in my opinion, you have not done enough to make the, the, the contracts more robust. You have not implemented the statutory guidance. And I'll finish on this point. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I genuinely believe that this government needs to do more in promotion on the living wage and the, gov the government needs to look 
not just at the statutory guidance, but the contracts that are issued so that we can get more of those 414,000 people off the living wage, uh, on the live, onto the living wage and onto a decent level of living. Thank you. I remind members to speak through the chair in the chamber and also to speak to the microphones or the official report cannot pick up the remarks. John Wilson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also congratulate Neil Finlay on securing this debate? Because I think it's always a timely reminder to have a debate on the living wage or the national minimum wage. Because I think, as I said in my earlier intervention, that I think the national minimum wage should be the living wage and not a false ceiling in terms of what we're intending to pay employees, no matter where they're employed. As James Kelly said, the 414,000 uh, workers in Scotland who may not be affected by the living wage also deserve those rights as well. I can also thank Gavin Brown for uh, Gavin's intervention and uh, contribution to this debate because it's one of the most positive Conservative Party contributions that I've heard in the time in the Chamber uh, because clearly, uh, and I hope it's a welcome sign, the Conservative Party are moving forward to accept the living wage is something that should be advanced and supported uh, and the employers uh, that sometimes cry out in terms of the CBI against such uh, interventions such as a living wage will be tell the CBI that it is a good positive move to take forward the living wage. But I have to, and I'm not sure whether Lewis MacDonald will view this as a negative contribution, but I have to remind members the living wage is only part of an overall scheme of things that can actually benefit people and raise people out of in-work poverty. Because while we talk about raising the living wage, there is no mention of the tax credits and other benefits that workers rely on to actually survive, and they're only surviving. And by raising the living wage at the present moment, many of these workers may actually be penalised at the end of the year by the removal of the tax credits and benefits that they receive. So we have to bear in mind that when we talk about a living wage and we talk about a living income, then we have to also take on board the other benefits that employees receive in relation to their survival. Take it, Lewis MacDonald's intervention. Lewis MacDonald. I'm very grateful. Mr Wilson will recall that I mentioned precisely that point in my own contribution, that it's the combination of the minimum wage, the living wage, and tax credit support that's critical. It's a government that actually wants to achieve the desired objectives that will make all the difference. Tom Wilson. Thank Lewis MacDonald for his intervention, and I accept he agrees with me in terms of my analysis, uh, because while we talk about tax credits and other benefits, we've also got to look at the hours employees are being offered. Uh, and at the present moment, when we talk about zero-hour contracts, or short-term working contracts, because we, don't, we refer to zero hour, but there are many workers throughout Scotland who are on five hour a week contracts, 12 hour a week contracts, 16 hour a week contracts. Introducing the living wage for many of these employees wouldn't really raise their income levels on a weekly basis. And we have to ensure there is security of employment as well, and that work is there for them to do that. The issue in terms of the contracts, government contracts, but also local government contracts, I would welcome the opportunity to look at what local authorities are doing throughout Scotland in terms of the, particularly the ones who have set up alios and what the alios are doing in relation to the living wage and whether or not they're encompassing some of the ideals that uh, Neil Finlay has exposed today to ensure that workers are on full-time contracts where they want full-time contracts, but are being paid the living wage like other council employees as well. And that ALIO should not be seen as a shorthand excuse for reducing the income levels of staff being transferred to ALIOs or employed by ALIOs. So I welcome the debate and I hope we can move this debate forward and we can get a, a situation where the living wage is the national minimum wage and we actually introduce a living wage that benefits everyone in society and takes people out of inward poverty or poverty. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. And I now invite Keith Brown to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, seven minutes or so, please. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I would also congratulate Neil Finlay on securing this debate today, which uh, seeks to tackle low pay and job insecurity, uh, and that's crucial to achieving the Scottish Government's vision of a successful Scotland. Uh, and to that end, this morning, the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work Skills and Training attended the first meeting of the Fair Work Convention, and that's an independent body which will develop a blueprint for fair work best practices in Scotland and also publish a fair work framework early next year. We are already do, leading the way by doing uh, all we can within the current powers we have to ensure as many people as possible uh, benefit from the living wage. And to come back, first of all, to some of the points made by James Kelly, I thought he made a number of very good points, especially why uh, paying a living wage is in the interest of the employer, both in terms of recruitment and retention, and also in terms of productivity. If you're paying somebody a wage they can live on, then you'll get more out of that person just by virtue of having done that. But he also made the allegation that we're hiding behind EU legislation. Well, just let's look at who else is hiding behind the EU legislation. Glasgow City Council said EU regulations do not allow the living wage as a mandatory requirement within our contracts. Renfrewshire, West Lothian and Inverclyde all responded to freedom of information requests stating that their contracts do not include a mandatory requirement that suppliers pay the living wage. The London boroughs, which uh, James Cayley mentioned, also say they claim to mandate the living wage, but they also say procurement could potentially be of a cross-border interest where either the EU procurement directives or EU treaty principles apply, uh, and the requirement for a London living wage should not be made a precondition at the tender stage. Now, uh, you see a lot of evidence, and I think the most compelling evidence is, despite what's been said by many Labour spokespeople for quite some time, that this was a fig leaf to try and I don't know, I suppose the allegation we didn't really want to pay the living wage. This is a fig leaf. Labour's own manifesto now talks about promoting the living wage, not mandating it. And perhaps you should reconcile some of the rhetoric which you've heard today with that position, which we agree with and are doing a great deal to try and achieve. Now, despite pretty sharp reductions imposed on the Scottish budget by London, we have taken steps to protect the pay of our lowest earning public sector workers, including a commitment to support the living wage through our pay policy for the duration of this Parliament. And somebody else also mentioned that the Abellio contract, the biggest contract which the Scottish Government lets, £8 billion worth of public money, not just everybody directly employed, but every subcontractor, whether cleaning, catering or whatever, also paid, guaranteed to be paid the living wage. We have also provided further funding to the Poverty Alliance to promote the take-up of the Living Wage Accreditation Initiative in every sector. And last month, the First Minister announced a new target for the Poverty Alliance, 500 accredited living wage employers by the end of March 2016. And that follows the achievement of the target of 150, eight months ahead of schedule. I understand there are now over 100, uh, 180 Scots-based living wage accredited employers. And that is a sign, I think, in itself that employers are now recognising the benefits the living wage can bring to their staff and their businesses. And in fact, consultants KPMG published a report on Monday which showed that Scotland is the most living wage aware region of the UK. Nine out of ten people have heard of the living wage and that report also confirms that Scotland has one of the highest proportion of earners in the UK now paid above the living wage. Uh, if I could turn to the point made by Gavin Brown and like John Wilson I agree it was a very constructive point uh, and I undertake to look further into it but what I would say is that uh, the myriad of contracts which are let by public authorities especially local authorities I don't think admit of the idea that we can give guidance for all eventualities and I think it's also true to say specifically in relation to local authorities they will have uh, their legal teams, I accept, not as extensive as the Scottish Government's uh, legal uh, resources, but they will have their legal teams and their autonomous bodies, so they will have to take, in certain circumstances, their own advice uh, to make sure that they are uh, observing the legal requirements. But I'll undertake, as I say, to look further into that. Minister, when you turn away from the microphone, I'm afraid it gets more difficult for the Chamber to hear you. Apologies, President Officer. Uh, some members mentioned public procurement and promoting the living wage through public procurement is a weak alternative, in my view, to having the powers over employment law, which we asked the Smith Commission to deliver, a plea which was not supported by other parties, in fact, was vehemently and specifically opposed uh, by the Labour Party. But we are right to expect the delivery of the highest quality services and for those that deliver the services to offer their employees fair and equitable employment terms. And I believe that employees, as I've said in response to James Kelly's point, who are treated fairly, will in turn deliver a higher quality of service. And as we implement the Procurement Reform Act and the EU Procurement Directives, we are focusing on using procurement as a lever for economic growth, supporting a fairer Scotland, streamlining the public sector's dealings with business and adopting more efficient practices that secure best value for the public purse. I will do. Neil Finlay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, will it now be standard practice for the Scottish Government to use uh, that contract weighting in every applicable contract to try and drive up uh, fair pay. Uh, 
And on two other points, since I've got the opportunity, will the Minister directly uh, look into the issue of TerraQuest oper operating at Disclosure Scotland, who are paying very much poverty pay, and the fiddle clause being used in the museum service and at um, Visit Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I can ask on the last two points that Neil Finlay raised, that if he writes to me, then I'll respond specifically to the, uh, to the points. So I think the first point that he, was that he raised, which I think it should be on the uh, clause. What I would say is, as we've been asked to do by a number of speakers, we are using every possibility, every avenue that we can see to try and achieve this. And it's brought some success, I've mentioned already, in relation to Abelio. And current contracts which we're looking at, we're looking at ways in which we can say to people, the workforce... Um, if you like, the workforce uh, well-being is a very important part on how sustainable we see a contract being, so they should address that. There are a number of ways that we can do that. We don't want to be too prescriptive, but if it achieves the result which you want to see being achieved, which is the living wage being paid, and it's not just, I think, as John Wilson said, about the living wage, there are other aspects to employee well-being, then we'll take those opportunities. Uh, since February, we've been consulting on changes to the public procurement rules. The deadline for responses is actually today. Uh, as part of that process, we've sought views on the content of the statutory guidance which has been mentioned and in advance of that uh, guidance on workforce matters and procurement which shares the, the lessons from an approach we piloted to encourage the living wage in our own contract for catering services and that offers practical guidance to purchasers on how and when workforce matters to go back to the point that Neil Finlay raised including payment of the living wage could be considered should be considered in the course of a public procurement exercise and this will inform the development of statutory guidance to give as uh, Gavin Brown raised uh, as much sure, surety certainty assurance as possible to others publicly uh, public procurers when they seek to do the same thing and we've already engaged with key stakeholders I've spoken to the STUC myself on the published guidance note and we'll engage further with them and others as we work to fast track that guidance to have it in place by the autumn. Uh, Presiding officer I must uh, also agree with uh, many others who have said today that we have to tackle low pay and job insecurity uh, in Scotland as a key priority. I do think, uh, if you go back to one or two of the points made, council funding was raised, I think, by Neil Funley. I didn't see any amendment to the budget that we proposed or to the local government finance order as to how much more we should pay local government. If we'd seen that, perhaps we'd have attached more uh, importance to the, the, the point that was being made. I don't see a manifesto commitment mandating a living wage, although I think everybody expected that to come given the rhetoric that we've had. Um, and also, I don't think we should um, uh, forget the point that the people have actually changed this. And it's not just because it's the SNP government, but it's because times have changed and people are much more aware of how damaging low pay can be. We could do this now. If, if, if the UK government was willing to give us not just the responsibility, but not the power, if they're willing to give us the power over the minimum wage, then that is the sole quickest way to deal uh, with the scourge of low pay. And that's been refused up till now. But despite that, I would encourage public and private sector organisations to follow our lead, paying the living wage to their own staff and considering how they can maximise the opportunities in their own procurement exercises to promote fair employment practices and workforce matters, including living wage and all relevant contracts. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes Neil Finlay's debate on expanding coverage of the living wage, and I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30 p.m. <laughs>